Uh, I used to call him our revivalist in EGFM because if you don't feel like praying, just listen to Pastor Leke. Let them just give you Pastor Leke drug too. You will become a prayer machine. <laughs> I really want to thank God for him. And not only does he bless me when he leads prayers, I love to listen to him every time. Everybody close to me know that I don't joke with Pastor Leke. I love him so much. He's my brother, he's my friend, and he's my pastor. I really love him. I love his family. And I'm so persuaded in what God is doing in his life. Let's say amen. All right, Pastor Mike, thank you very much for being seated. Uh, pastor Uncle Mike, according to Pastor TJ yesterday. Thank you very much. Pastor Mike is a very humble man. <laughs> Pastor Mike is a very humble man. I respect him a lot. He is reliable and he's a faithful person. I emulate him. I look at him a lot. I talk a lot about him when I get home, especially when I'm you know, talking to my wife. I said one of the unsung heroes we have in the ministry is Pastor Mike. You know, Pastor, thank you very much. Thank you for all that you do for us. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, I hope I've not left anybody out. All right, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we give you glory and thanks. Thank you for Thursday. Thank you for Friday. Thank you for today. Thank you for all that you have begun to do. Thank you for what you are going to do again. We give you glory. We give you all the praise and thanks. Accept our thanks in the name of Jesus. Thank you for what you are doing in all the respective centers. Thank you for what you are doing in um, Benue. Thank you for what you are doing in Abuja. Thank you for what you are doing in Kebi. Thank you for what you are doing in Port Harcourt. Thank you for what you are doing across the world. We give you all the glory and praise, our Father. Thank you because this word that is planted as a seed will grow to become a mighty tree. We thank you because we will witness the prosperity of your counsel across the earth. Thank you because we will witness the prosperity and the growth of your word in each of these centers. We give you all the glory, our Father. Thank you for what you have done by reason of this summit. Thank you for what you did on Thursday. Thank you for what you did on Friday. Thank you for what you did through all the sessions where we have listened to your word through your servants. Thank you for what you are going to also do today. We give you all the glory, our Father. Accept our thanks in Jesus' name. And Lord, I ask that you will help me this morning. You will help me to, to bless your people. Help me to help your people. Help me, Lord Jesus. Show mercy to everyone listening. Show mercy. I receive grace for understanding. I receive grace for simplicity. I receive grace for clarity. I receive grace for so much power being made available to turn souls to where they should be. Thank you, Lord, because you've answered our prayers. We give you all the glory, our Father. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay, I don't know, you know, I don't even know where to start because from Thursday, the meeting kicked off on a very high note and, you know, it's just been like that. There has not been a decline. There has just been ascension upon ascension upon ascension. And I'm going to start with something that Pastor Leke said, you know. So as I'm talking, I'll most likely still be... As I'm making reference to Pastor Lake, I'm making reference to Pastor Tokbe, Pastor Ewa, and you know, all the pastors. <laughs> so um, Pastor Lake said something very profound, and that was how the meeting began. And as he began to minister that Thursday, I just felt, you know, I was telling Pastor Tokbe after the meeting, that I just felt the cloud of missions, you know, descending, you know. I felt it on my head. I felt it also in the atmosphere, you know, and it's beautiful. And Pastor T told me, he said, that means that is a sign that there is something behind missions. And what is behind missions is not um, the zeal. One thing I know about daddy is that daddy is not looking for church expansion. Daddy is not wanting to say, okay, uh, guys, so let's go and you know, start a church <laughs> somewhere else. We want to start a church in Makoti. That's not the idea. That's not the idea. And like I always say, you know, every time we, we will go to Makoti, that we are not here to tell you you have been doing it the wrong way. We are not here to tell you that you are not getting it. We are here to help your faith. We are not here to lord it over your faith. We are here to help your faith. I remember the first message, you know, uh, Daddy, uh, uh, Daddy, our pastor preached the first time he got to Makodi. You know, somehow, somehow I was able to get that particular message and I listened to it. And pastor said something very profound. He said, the reason God sent us here is because actually you have been doing some things right. 
you know, that the reason God sent us here is because we've been doing some things right. And he has sent us to just help push you further, you know, so that you will be in the very center of what God is doing in our days and in our time. You know, so uh, that has been in my heart, you know, because this message is not a message you preach to dead people. This is a message you preach to people who are quickened in their spirits and people who are already added to the church. And we have seen a lot of increase, you know, in the spirits. We've seen a lot of increase in life, you know, in each and every one of these centers. So that is also what I'm going to be saying to us today. In case you are just connecting for the very first time, you know, we are here because we are doing something right. And then what you are doing right or what you are doing good can be done better. So nobody's taking ministry from you. Nobody wants to hijack your church from you. Nobody is coming to tell you that, you know, maybe um, everything you have been doing since is a hoax. No, we are just here to help your faith. Let's say amen. amen. All right. So Pastor Lickie began by... Sir? <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Daddy. So uh, Pastor Lickie began the message by saying that you are born again to begin a journey, you know, and honestly speaking, by the time you, we open this Bible from Genesis to Revelation, like he rightly pointed out, the Bible is a book that spells out a journey, you know, and every journey has a beginning point and every journey also has an ending point. Every journey begins somewhere and it is designed to terminate at a particular destination. Now, um, when we check the Bible, one of the stories, you know, as I was ministering, one of the uh, impressions I had in my heart was Israel, you know, and uh, God, Israel found themselves in Egypt. Actually, Genesis chapter 12, God appeared to a man called Abraham, and God spoke to him that I will make of you a great nation. That means Abraham, you know, a, a nation was supposed to come out of Abraham, or Abraham was supposed to become a nation. And that nation was to be a great nation. Now, um, Abraham gave birth to Isaac. Isaac gave birth to Jacob. Jacob gave birth to 12 sons and then one daughter. And then they were the ones who actually, at a particular time when there was famine everywhere, Joseph was sold. So they entered into Egypt. It was actually in Egypt that they became a nation. Praise God. It was in Egypt that they became a nation. But what God told Abraham was not just that, I will make of you a nation. God told Abraham, I will make of you a great nation. So, and when we check everything that God did in um, Egypt to bring Israel out of the land of Egypt, you will find uh, different kinds of plagues. Some of those plagues we understand, some of them we don't understand. You know, anytime I read the Bible, I don't read the Bible in a hurry. I will just read, I just pause. Then I just put myself in the shoes of the people who are there. Now, one of the plagues that actually intrigued me a lot is, the Bible says there was darkness in Egypt. That darkness so much that nobody left where they stood for three days. Now, that was a plague. You know, that's not the darkness caused by Nepa. It's not the darkness that is caused by solar eclipse. That darkness must have been very thick. Now, God moved you know, to that extent to bring a people out. Now, it's not the, the people themselves were not the real reason, or let me say the people themselves were not the remote reason or the primary reason God decided to bring Israel out. The primary reason God decided to bring Israel out was the promise he made to their great grandfather, Abraham. So God spoke to him that I will make of you a great nation. Now, when Israel was in Egypt, God began to afflict Egypt, or let me say, God began to bring judgments upon Egypt, different kinds of plagues, to bring Israel out of Egypt, so that Israel will realize their full potential. Or let me say, so that the destiny that has been waiting for Israel will become actualized. Let's say amen. So, now, in Egypt, there was a land that Israel was given, it was called Goshen. Now, one thing that happened is that everything that was happening in Egypt to the Egyptians were not happening to the Israelites. You know, you know just forgive me in my mind. I'm just, you know, just thinking. Assuming, you know, you, an Israelite has a friend in the other place and then you are at the border. 
This is Goshen. And then this is Egypt. And then darkness fell upon this land. Imagine, you know, you are just standing in between. So this place is light. <laughs> this place is dark. You know, that one alone is enough to make people fear Israel in Egypt. But as far as God was concerned, that was not the definition of greatness he spoke to Abraham about. So that evil is happening to people, you know, but you are exempted does not necessarily mean that you have come into the promise that God has for all his children. You know, sometimes when we minister and then we talk about the gospel of Christ, we talk about salvation, some people are like, why are you overflowing this matter? I'm enjoying my Christianity. The last time I was traveling, there was an accident. Everybody died except me. God is good to me. You know, people are having COVID-19 and then I escape. God is good to me. So what else are you saying needs to be added, you know, to what I am currently doing? My God is a miracle worker. My God is a God that does so much wonders. You know, he heals me when I'm sick. Not only does he heal me, he even uses me to heal other people. Now, all of those experiences are Goshen experiences. Now, all of those experiences are so wonderful. They are experiences you can actually have in Egypt. You know, and that in itself is not the explanation or definition of greatness that God has in mind for his people. Let's say amen. All right, God knew that Israel would not arrive at that, uh, that height or that promise that God made to Abraham would not be realized if Israel was not led out of the land of Egypt. Now, one thing about nationhood is that every nation first, before you can be termed to be a nation, you must be independent. And then to be independent means you have to have your own set of laws governing you different from the laws of the nation that you are under. So Israel, even though they were in Egypt, you know, ate like the Egyptians would eat. They would think, they thought like the Egyptians thought, you know, and then they did things in the manner of Egypt. That's why when they got to the wilderness, you know, and then they began to complain to Moses, they said, ah, ah, there were graves in Egypt. In Egypt, they knew how to bury their dead. In Egypt, there was a particular way they, you know, they had taste boards of Egypt. So God looked at it and said, you guys are a nation, you know, but you will not become what I want you to be until one, you become independent. One, you walk out, you come out from among them. And then that coming out will bring them into a space called the wilderness. Now, that wilderness is the place where God will now commit to them the testimony that is designed to make them great. So because that testimony is like their constitution. That testimony is like, okay, this is actually what makes us different. Now, the fact that things are happening to every other person around and it's not happening to you in God's sight does not necessarily make you different. Praise God. <laughs> so they were to you know, get to the wilderness and then the testimony was to be committed to them. Now, that testimony you know, was there. When God, uh, Moses was talking to them in Deuteronomy, he said, this will be your wisdom before the nations. This actually is what is going to make you different from every other nation across the world. Any other nation that does not have this testimony that you are being enjoined to as God's people are Gentiles. They are dogs. Inside that particular testimony, there are promises. Inside that particular testimony, there are commandments. Inside that particular testimony, there are ordinances. You know, there are, you know, and those things are, you know, that testimony is not, is not, that testimony is not just, does not just contain the secret of how they will prosper. That testimony is all encompassing. It's something that has to find expression in how they live their lives, you know. Their sitting down is inside. Their rising up is inside. When they farm, the testimony informs how they farm. When they harvest, the testimony informs how they harvest. When they you know, procreate, the testimony determines how they do it. You know, relationship within family members is determined by that particular testimony. That testimony actually is the uniqueness of Israel from every other nation on the face of the earth. Let's say amen. So in the same way, when we get born again as believers, you know, our spirits are quickened. And, you know, a whole lot has been said from the beginning of the meeting. All our pastors, you know, the Lord has used them to stress the fact that the part of us that actually embarks on a journey is our soul. You know, our soul is the sojourner. Our soul is the person that is on transit. Our spirit is quickened from the dead. Our souls are added to church so that our soul will be able to make a journey. 
you know, to the desired destination that is in God's sight or that is in God's heart. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, so now, um, the fact that my spirit is quickened can give me a Goshen-like experience, even though my soul has not started to journey. You know, Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. So, it automatically means that these signs shall not follow those who believe not. So, that means if you don't believe, there are signs that won't follow you. But if you believe, there are signs that will follow you. So, now, part of the signs that will follow a believer is that in my name, they shall cast out demons. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. If they drink any deadly thing, they shall not hurt them. If they take up serpents in their hands and all of that, it won't hurt them. Now, by the time you put all of this together, for some people, you know, for a lot of believers, I was also there many, many years ago before God helped me and showed me mercy. You know, you would think that is what Christianity was all about. But that is not what Christianity is all about. You know, that was just a Goshen-like experience that you are given. You know, <laughs> there is still a journey to be embarked on. You know, because there has to be, a testimony has to be committed to you. Now, that testimony is actually what makes you different. That you can lay hands on the sick and have them recover does not necessarily make you different from somebody who cannot before God. Now, what makes you different is the testimony that runs your life. Now, God said to Abraham, he said, I will make your name great. Now, one of the things I've discovered about greatness is that greatness is not, greatness has more to do with who you are or what you are becoming. Let's go to uh, Genesis chapter. Genesis chapter. That place where Abraham was looking for a wife for Isaac. That's Genesis chapter. Okay, Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24. verse 35. Genesis chapter 24, verse 35. Genesis 24, verse 35. Okay. Um, now, this was Abraham's servant who was sent to bring a wife for Abraham's son. That was Isaac. So, he went, he prayed, Abraham made him swear, you know, put his hand under his thigh and, you know, he swore. And here he was talking to her and he said something in verse 35. Now, um, a servant that Abraham will make to swear was not an ordinary servant. That is a servant that has almost risen to the stature of his son. So if there's anybody that knows Abraham well, he's this man. So, verse 35, it says, And the Lord has blessed my master greatly, and he is become great. And he has given him flocks and herds, and silver and gold, and men servants, and maid servants, and camels, and asses. Now, uh, he said, now verse 35, that's where I'm going. I'm not going to 36. He said, and the Lord has blessed my master greatly, and he is become great. So God blessed Abraham greatly, and the essence of that blessing was what Abraham became. So then he now said, and he has given him flocks. So the flocks and herds and silver and gold that he had was not what made him great. All of those things were additions that God gave to a man that had already become great. So the greatness was in who he became. The greatness was in his constitution. You know, the greatness does not have anything to do with what he has amassed. The greatness has everything to do with who he has become. So, so that Israel will realize the greatness, you know, that God spoke to Abraham about. He, God knew he had to give them something that will constitute them differently from the way Egyptians were constituted. Let's say amen. amen. All right. So in the same way as believers, you know, if our constil, until our constitution changes, we are not really different, you know, from unbelievers. 
we are not really different from believers. Our spirits are quickened. We give God all the praise. And by reason of that, you know, I know who I am in Christ. I know who I am in Christ. All of those things will just give you a wonderful Goshen experience. You know, but the soul has to move from that particular place into a place where a testimony will be committed to that soul. So, what test, so, so the testimony I'm talking about to us is actually our testimony as New Testament believers. There is a way God it designed us to live. Now, why do we need a new testimony? Why do we need a reconstitution from within? Now, the reason is because in Genesis, our father swallowed something. Genesis chapter 3. The Bible says that, um, okay, let's go there. Genesis chapter 3. You know, because um, in Makati, we used to open the Bible a lot. And we'll read it together. So that people will not just look at you and admire you. <laughs> and then sometimes we help them open the Bible too. You know, because when we say oh, efficient, somebody can be opening Psalm. You now say, no, 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 that's not where Psalm is, so efficient. So are you in efficient? Are you in efficient? Are you, you just go around like that. Okay, so can we all read together? You know, so that you know that's the word of God. It's not the opinion of a Lagos pastor. <laughs> One of my friends went to minister somewhere, spoke for two hours. We're just ministry, ministry, ministry. When he finished, somebody walked to him and said, wow, your spoken English is top notch. <laughs> Do you get Now that's a waste of time. <laughs> You know, people can just be admiring, you know, after two hours of preaching and sweating. The guy almost felt like crying. <laughs> it's English that they are hearing. They just sat down. You know, sometimes somebody sits down and this person is looking at the person. Is like, hmm, it's not what you have said that hits the person. <laughs> it's another reality. Wow. Can my children talk like this? Do you get it? But that's not where we are there. <laughs> that's not where we are sent. We are sent to make you understand. And because of that, you know, we have to open the Bible and then we read you know, I used to be very fast, talk, pop, 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 but when I got to Marco, they had to become slow. <laughs> very slow. Just take it gradually, you know, like that. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 and verse 7. We've read from this page, this place in this meeting, you know, um, many times. Genesis chapter 3 from verse 6 to verse 7. It says, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes. Okay, let me read from verse. Okay, from verse. From verse four. And the serpent said unto the woman, "You shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil." And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sealed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So um, their eyes did not become open when they touched the fruit. When they ate the fruit and something entered into them, that was when their eyes became open. Now, this tree was not just an ordinary tree that was planted there. You know, it's not a tree like we see, and it's not just a fruit, just not any how kind of fruit. You know, uh, because this is a garden that God planted. This is different from the trees that God created in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, trees came out of different kinds. But by the time we got to chapter 2, we find God now planting a garden. And then inside that garden, he put trees. Now, one thing about that garden and the trees inside that garden was that they were meant for the upgrading of man's nature. You see, the ones outside the garden were meant for food. You know, supply nutrients to the body and replenish the body. But the ones inside the garden were meant for the upgrading of man's nature. You know, and that is the reason why a tree will have what it takes to transfer wisdom to a, to a person. Now, nobody has taken mango before and suddenly knew biology. Or you just bought apple and then you just ate it and immediately you just understood the issues of this natural life. Now, you know, imagine if you see a woman that sells that kind of apple, she will become a millionaire. Do you get as in? You just imagine just going to the, no, no, honestly speaking, you don't need to send your children to school. Let everybody just kill before her. Pineapple, pineapple, mango. You know, imagine just taking mango and you knew for that math. Do you understand? You know? <laughs> So, this tree was desirable to make one wise. Now, the place of wisdom is not the body, it's the soul. 
So that means that if you partake of this tree, something will happen to your soul. Something will happen to your body. And something will also happen to your spirit. Let's say amen. Okay, so um, this tree was planted. Someone asked me a question yesterday, you know, when uh, Pastor Kolade was ministering. The person just sent me a chat that, uh, uh, that Pastor Kolade said that it's not God who planted the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that, you know, they felt it was God. I said it's not God, you know. And let me just say it in case there are other people probably hearing this for the first time who don't understand. Now, um, you cannot give what you don't have. How many of us know that? You can't give what you don't have. Now, that tree, they call it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But one thing that Jesus told us about trees is that every tree is known not by the name it answers, but by the fruits that it bears. So even though they call it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then you have to check the fruits that it bears. God said to Adam, in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. That means that tree is not meant to minister any other thing except death. You know, so it's a tree of death. And of course, it makes sense because the opposite tree is the tree of life. So it's life and death that was set in front of Adam. So um, now, can you imagine God planting a tree and telling man not to eat of the tree he has planted? Now, that looks like a confused God to me. You know, because imagine God planting a tree. I planted a tree, oh, and then I'm telling Adam that don't eat of this tree that I have planted. Now, that doesn't look okay. Yes, you know. So, Pastor TJ said that's temptation. Now, one thing the Bible tells us is that God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither does he himself tempt anybody. You know, but when you check that tree, you find a guest on that tree. There is a preacher on that tree. Now, that preacher can rest on that tree because that tree is his product. That preacher cannot stay on any other thing because it was God who created every other thing. So that thing was his own particular material and product. That's why he can nest in the shades of that tree, you know, and then talk to Eve. And then by extension, reached the husband. And then he was preaching the tidings of that particular tree. What that tree will do for them, you know, and it's of note. It's important, you know, we just see some of the promises inside that tree. Praise God. All right, so the woman said, the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. Then he now said, God knows that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened. And you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So he was preaching, you know, what will happen to them if they will partake of that particular tree. And immediately they ate of that tree, you know. Immediately they ate of that tree. Once the seed of the tree entered their soul, it gave them another sight. You know, they began to see things differently. Now, um, Adam before the fall and Adam after the fall were not the same persons. Now, sometimes when we read the Bible, you know, they say, we will just read, 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 and then we just lump everything together like it's a story, you know, that they are telling us, but that's not it. Now, when we check Adam before the fall, there was a way Adam was. When we check Adam after the fall, then we see the way Adam was then that gives us an impression of what he partook of from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, let me give us an example. I'm still going somewhere. <laughs> let me give us an example. I just feel, let me just lay this so that we'll be able to understand, you know, by the time I cross to that other side. So, now, before Adam, when Adam was made, Adam was in the Garden of Eden, God, the Bible says God put him there to tend the garden and keep it. So that was the work Adam was doing. Adam didn't originate a job description for himself. It was God who gave him the job or the task that he was doing. So Adam saw animals, you know, and all of that. God brought the animals to him. That's what the Bible says. God brought the animals to him to see what he would call them. So God brought the animals to Adam. Adam wasn't the one who went to meet them and name them. It was God who brought the animals to him. Then um, Adam was there in the garden. He didn't think of a wife. It was God who thought for him. It was God who said, it is not good for man to be alone. So now we, we find an Adam that was a follower. We found an Adam that, you know, God will chart the course. Then Adam will follow. But after Adam ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we discovered that Adam began to become proactive. <laughs> Adam began to make the move by himself. Adam, Adam, the Bible says, 
you know, um, he saw that he was naked. And he did not wait. He moved to solve his own problem, you know, by himself. So, like Pastor Tijo was describing yesterday night, talking about uh, a kind of life that does not need God to exist. Now, that was what the tree, that was the seed that entered into their soul. So, when we say sin, actually, that is what sin really is. You know, is that law of independence from God. That thing that makes a man arrive at a conclusion outside of God. Now, the serpent said, you shall know good. And you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. Honestly speaking, what makes a god a god is ability to determine what is good and evil. But immediately Adam partook of this particular tree, they began to feel a sense of determining by themselves what is good and what is evil without reliance on God. Praise God. Without reliance on God. So they determined for themselves and by themselves what is good and what is evil. That thing gave them another kind of eye with which they saw things. You know, so if it looks good to you, you do it. If it does not look good to you, you don't do it. So, and uh, Adam, you know, uh, uh, sowed fig leaves, covered his own nakedness. You know, I always say that he determined his problem by himself and also determined the solution. Actually, he didn't do it by himself. The teacher on that tree moved inside when he ate of that particular fruit. So that teacher that was speaking on the tree began to speak from inside and then instructing him what to do and what not to do. So sin can prefer solution to problems. That is preferring solution to problem does not mean it is God that is preferring that solution to problem. The only way you can know, you know how you can do it, just check it, was reliance on God a means to get the problem solved. Praise God. I'm going somewhere. So, so now, Adam already moved, you know, along that line of, you know, sowing fig leaves, solving his problem by himself. God saw it, and God decided to arrest that journey because it was the soul that was journeying. The soul was moving. God saw it and arrested that journey. God took an animal, you know, probably killed that animal, took the skin of that animal, covered Adam, and we never found Adam exploring that path anymore. But you see that part that Adam forsook, that was what Cain now took up. So Cain now explored that understanding, that new understanding that visited them. You know, Cain explored it to the end. And the end of it was that Cain left God. The end of it was that Cain left God's presence. Now, the presence as they know it is not the presence as we know it. The presence is not coming to church. You know, that, you know, we're in the presence of God. Now, an example is Zechariah and Gabriel. If Zechariah was, Zechariah was in the temple, you would say Zechariah was in God's presence. Imagine somebody asking, where is grandpa? He said, grandpa is in church, in God's presence. But a higher, an angel came, and that angel spoke, and then the man doubted. He said, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. You know, so you know, presence differs from presence. So the way, <laughs> the way those guys in Genesis understood presence is different from the way we today understand presence. So... So Gabriel, um, Cain left God's presence. Adam didn't leave God's presence. God drove him out. But Cain, by himself, looked at God, sized him up, and concluded he was done with God. And then he left. Now, that is the end of that part that, you know, um, that sin opened up for man from Genesis. Let's say amen. All right, so, and that thing prospered like that among, you know, on the earth. Nimrod came, and then when we get to Genesis chapter 6, we find the sons of God and, you know, daughters, plenty, you know, a whole lot happened. And then that thing gradually precipitated into cultures of nations. That thing, you know, cultures of people, you know, gradually like that, like that. And then suddenly Egypt emerged, and Israel found themselves in Egypt. But God now bringing Israel out wanted to now show them another way to live. So, the same happens also to us in church. Now, when we get born again, there has to be, you know, the, God now has to bring us to a particular place or move us to, now that place is called wilderness. When Pastor Topper was ministering you know, the, on the first day, he was talking about people who, he was using himself as an example. It happened to me also. And then I discovered that it's not just me. I went to minister somewhere last month and I asked them, I said, how many of you, you know, did your faith work for you every time? As in every time you use faith for something, you always get it. Nobody raised hands. Even the pastor did not raise hands. So I said, okay, how many of you, you know, sometimes you just feel like 
this thing, maybe, you know, and then everybody raised hands. That's, have you ever prayed at some point and then your prayer didn't get answered? You stood on every scripture you can stand on. Every scripture was standing on. And then the result, you know, <laughs> the result was different from what you expected. Everybody raised hands. Now, that gives me an impression, and that impression is that you will find God moving people from a place of comfort into a place where testimony can be committed into their hands. But most of the time, people don't know. So sometimes people just look at that and they say, my fasting is not enough. And then they increase, double up on fasting. You know, sometimes they look at it, maybe my tithe is not enough, double up on that. No, now, there's no amount of all of those things that you are doing that solves the problem or answers the question. The question is on pilgrimage. So we have to be moved. So you find God moving people to a particular place where he will commit his testimony into their hands. And the beginning of the committer of that testimony is Christ. Let's say amen. amen. Okay, Romans chapter 1. I'm, gradually, I'm moving to the end of my charge this morning. I hope we have been blessed. I hope I'm not boring us. Romans chapter 1. The book of Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and verse 17. Romans 1, verse 16 and verse 17. So Paul was speaking here. He said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, there is a gospel called the gospel of Christ. That gospel of Christ is not what we had when we got born again. When we got born again, we heard of how Christ died for us. You know, it's just similar to the Passover experience of Israel. You know, the Israelites were in Goshen, in their houses. But a lamb was killed, and then the blood of that lamb was applied on the lintel. So literally, where you will find every Israelite hiding, they are hiding behind that blood. So when death came around, you know, whenever he sees that blood on the lintel, it means a soul has been executed here. Then that angel moves. You know, that is actually the Passover. So when he sees blood... You know, because the life of the flesh is in the blood. That means his soul has been executed here, then he passes over. When he gets to a house without that blood, he knows no life has been taken. Then he goes in and takes life. Then when he moves to the next house and then he sees that there is blood, then he passes over it. The Bible speaks of Christ as our Passover lamb who was sacrificed for us. Now imagine an Israelite who does not believe what the blood has done. That's so, uh, what are people doing? You just lamp, you just put it on your lintel, and you think it's not enough to stop death. And then that Israelite comes out of that covering and wants to face this, <laughs> face that angel of death by himself. You know he's going to be dead. You won't even know what killed him. <laughs> he won't even know what killed him. You know, before you know anything, as it's got, the guy is dead. Because you are supposed to hide behind the blood. Now, when we get born again, you know, the blood, the blood. You know, uh, the blood purchased our souls, and then the blood also worked in quickening our spirits. Are we together? So when I said the new birth and, you know, all the attendant benefits are like Goshen experience, that's also what I'm talking about. Because you have to hide behind the blood to do everything you are doing. So Jesus died for me. Jesus did this. Now, all of those things that you believe, all of those things that we affirm are not the gospel of Christ. So we now, now, we now have to come to a place where we now begin to hear the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. So after we have believed, we now need to hear Christ being preached to us. Because the gospel of Christ being preached to us is the testimony of Christ being given to us as God's people. Now that testimony is our wisdom before the Gentiles. That testimony is our separation from other nations that exist on the face of the earth. Are we together? Now, there's something about that testimony. Verse 17. It says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So what is inside the gospel of Christ that makes it the power of God unto salvation is what it contains. And what is inside it is the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. Are we together? The righteousness of God. Now, I discovered something. That this righteousness of God, we don't know it. That's why it says it has to be revealed. So it is revealed when Christ is preached. Now, 
before we begin to hear the gospel of Christ, even though our spirits are quickened, there are things we consider right and there are things we consider wrong. Are we together? The Bible says in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. So everybody has eyes within from the tree of knowledge of good and evil that determines for us what is right and what is wrong. We have eyes within that determine for us what is good and what is evil in our sight. But God looks at it and says, if this nation will be my nation, if this nation will be as great, you know, as I want them to be, then they have to begin to see things the way I see them. So that is where the gospel of Christ comes in. So the gospel of Christ now um, begins to reveal to us the righteousness of God. So when we say the righteousness of God, you know, the righteousness of God is what God calls right. How God thinks, like, you know, we have said, all the ministers have said, how he thinks and how he behaves. His ways and his thoughts. God's, what God calls right, what God considers to be right. Now, before, you see that eyes inside has told us some things that are good. This one is good. This one is bad. This one is right. This one is wrong. And then we have society that also affirms that particular thing that we have in our heart as right and as wrong. So, but when the gospel of Christ is being preached, you know, um, in Revelation chapter 19, the Bible says something about Jesus, who was the rider on the white horse. The Bible says, in righteousness, he judges and wages war. So when righteousness is being declared, what breaks out most of the time? You know, <laughs> in the souls of men. Now that war is not righteousness versus unrighteousness. No. Because the truth is our unrighteousness is not strong enough to combat God's righteousness. The only thing, that's why you'll find the tax collectors and the sinners and publicans repenting. They loved John the Baptist. They loved Jesus because they knew they were not righteous. But the people that withstood Jesus were people who had a righteousness. So the battle is not righteousness against unrighteousness. It is righteousness against righteousness. And that's why usually when Christ is being preached, you'll find a lot of questions. Are you trying to say it is not good? Nobody will ask you, are you trying to say it is good to fornicate? Because that's not the thing. That's not where it is. So when we say sin, what sin is standing on is a righteousness. When we say this world system, the world system is not a car, it's not a house, it's not anything. It is a system or a foundation of good and evil that is outside revelation. You know, a kind of righteousness that is outside of Christ. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> Do you understand? So when they say this world, this world, the foundation is righteousness. But that righteousness is not revealed righteousness. I I was speaking with one of our brothers who came to my place sometime. I think we spoke, I think maybe we spoke on the phone. So I told him, I said, that faith of the son, I think Pastor Tosin also said something like that in Anamnesis. Faith of the son is not designed to deal with the works of the flesh. Faith of the son is designed to deal with flesh. Because in some circles where word is being preached, milk at its purest form, you will find people dropping works of the flesh and they have not had faith of the son. You will find people who had issues with bodily uncleanness, fornication, adultery, and they will tell you, some of them in deeper life, some of them in, you know, maybe BLW, some of them in some other churches, maybe in Brother Billy's circles, Peace House, they will tell you, you know, how they used to have this kind of issue and suddenly the issue stopped and they did not know, they don't know anything about the hope of eternal life. Are we together? So faith of the son is designed to go for something. Flesh that is standing on a righteousness that God did not institute. You know, so that thing is that thing that tells you it is right. That's why, you know, when people processes around faith of the son, are always processes that challenge our righteousness. For example, it is okay for, you know, as a lady, by the time you are 25, married, by the time you are 30, you've given back to all your children. Stop. But suddenly you discover that by the time you, <laughs> what they are going to is that thing. Is a righteousness. Something that you were convinced about that this is how it should be. But you see, that thing is not after revealed righteousness. That thing is not Christ. That thing tells you what your life should be. That thing tells you, you know, how you will know. Indices by which you can measure a life that is moving forward. You know? So, this is how you know your life is progressing. You know, right now, you know, you are through with school. Immediately you finish, you have to go to serve, and then the job is waiting for you. You know, sometimes, and that thing informs our prayer points. You know, many times we go to NYSC. <laughs> 
a go to minister, LYC, um, send forth. And the people will tell you, you are not going to the labor market, you are going to the fever market. Do you understand? And all of that, you are going somewhere to happen. You are a bomb going somewhere to explode. All of those things, are <laughs> they are confessions and statements that sin has taught man to say. Do you understand? So all of those expectations are there. I remember, <laughs> I remember going so... <laughs> They are going to the favor market. You are not going to the labor market. You know? So when those people start out their lives, and then they get a job, and then they ask salary, they say 70000 That doesn't look like favor. After everything you have gone through in this life, with 70000 you'll not be looking around comparing yourself with all your friends. Ah, then how is my own difference? Now, that is sin. That is sin. You know? So, conclusions about our life that is completely different from what Christ teaches is sin. So now, I'm not talking about adultery, fornication. All of those things are obviously wrong. When the Bible says there is a way that seems right to man, adultery doesn't seem right to men. You know, it's not a way. Thank you, Daddy. Adultery is not a way. It's an act. <laughs> you know, adultery is not a way. You know, all of those things are not ways. There is a way that seems right to a man. You know, it seems right to the person. This is right. How will you know God is faithful to you when he goes according to your rightness? When things fall in place according to what you think it should be? You know, all of those things, that is the righteousness that the faith of the son combats. You know, in the epistle, I'll be rounding off in maybe two, three minutes. In the epistles, you know, I discover that every time the Bible talks about the righteousness of God, what they always put against it is another righteousness. The Bible says Israel, being ignorant of the righteousness of God, went ahead and established their own righteousness. Then you will find Paul saying that, that I may be found in him, not having my own righteousness, but the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ. So it is not unrighteousness versus righteousness. It is righteousness against righteousness. So when we say faith of the son, where that thing is, where the root, when we say a worldly man, a worldly man is a man whose definition of rightness is what the world approves. You know, so this is right, this is right. Everybody looks at it from different angles and they all conclude that it is right. Do you understand? <laughs> so, <laughs> so when they say this world, what is resting on is a righteousness. So Jesus said, my peace I give to you, not as the world give it. So if the world can give peace, it means the world has peace. Then if the world has peace, then it means the world must have righteousness and the world must have joy. Because this world is also a kingdom on its own. Do we get the picture? So it's a kingdom on its own. So it's a kingdom against another kingdom. So when the Bible says anyone that wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God, that is a man that has arrived at peace with this world. So what that face is set against is God. That person makes himself an enemy of God. So now, so when Christ is being preached, when we say faith of the son, the faith of the son is actually the teaching of what God calls right. This is how a man should be before God. You know, because when man fell, man's spirit died and his soul fell. When man fell, when we read Genesis chapter 1, you know, towards the last verse, he says that um, everything, God looked at everything he made and he said it was very good. And I used to use this grading system that we used to use in primary school. You know, very good is not the best. Here, you know, there is something called excellent. So there is still a realm above very good. And then there is a realm below very good. So after excellent, you get to very good. Then after very good, you get to good. Then after good, you get to average. Then after that, you get to fair. Then after that, you get to fail. <laughs> they fail. Do you understand? Only God knows how far man had fallen, you know, from very good. Because <laughs> Adam was not excellent. If Adam was excellent, when Adam died, his death would have been excellent. <laughs> like Lucifer's death. <laughs> yeah, so it was a very good death. <laughs> So help her to come from the excellent realm <laughs> to rescue man. <laughs> so man fell and that journey continued. Man kept falling and kept falling until man fell below good. So for God 
to consider somebody to be good, something has to upgrade that man. And that thing is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why did I say that, that thing has to upgrade man? Because the Bible says, daring is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And one thing the Bible tells us about righteousness is that righteousness exalts a nation. Are we together? So we have to be raised to a point where we are good enough in God's sight for salvation to continue. So Christ is the standard. Are we together? So Christ is the standard. So when we hear the righteousness of Christ, Christ is the model. Christ is the standard. When we get to a point where, you know, other things are our role models outside of Christ, we have not started hearing the gospel of Christ. You know, the gospel of Christ, you know, puts all our visions, everything, ambition, everything, narrows it down into a person. And that person is our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is the only one who is good. It doesn't matter whether you have stolen before, whether you have slept with someone before, or you are not. You are not good enough before God. What makes you not good enough is because you have already married a standard of exaltation lower than revealed knowledge. You know, so, um, so this gospel of Christ is our testimony. And that testimony is the only thing that can deal with the wrong testimony that had been established in our souls. That we live by. Now, we are not talking about adultery, fornication. We are just talking about something that runs your life. You know, almost without God, we can sit down and determine, just the way we can determine order of service without being in church. You can almost sit down and determine how a life should go. Now, you see, that thing is what the gospel of Christ is designed. That thing is seen. Sometimes you just find a young man who just sits down and just says, I need a wife. Now, it's not God. <laughs> Who told you? Pastor, Pastor CJ said, who told you that you need a wife? Do you understand? So now you just sit down and just arrive at some conclusions about your life and that thing is wrong. So when Christ is being preached, you know, uh, you see this thing we are talking about is our actual separation from this world. It's our actual separation. It will change everything about us. And then we we'll discover that even those of us who have issues with acts of sin, not way now, acts of sin, you'll find all of those things will dry up by the time they bring you into another way. And like you know, uh, Proverbs 14 says, righteousness exalts. You know, it's a path upwards. It's a path upwards. So that thing makes you go up. You know, that place that Pastor Ewai read, it says that as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and your thoughts higher, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. That distance, no fasting and prayer can scale it. The distance between heaven and the earth. How many ladders will you put together to make you touch heaven from the earth? So there is nothing that can travel that distance. The only hope is that something has to come from that height and come down. So that's why they now said, as the rain comes down. Rain doesn't go this way, it comes down. So that thing that comes down from heaven is what God calls my word. That comes out of my mouth. And when I read that place, you know, it says that it shall not come back to me void. It shall accomplish what I please. It's not what you please. Is what God pleases. Do we get? Because what you please is according to that wrong testimony that has to be taken away. So it will accomplish what He pleases, and it shall prosper in the thing where to He sends it. Now, the, how you will know the word has accomplished is that it makes you into a man God is pleased in, and that man is Christ. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. So I want to enjoin us, you know, to open our hearts. I don't know. I I hope I probably made things a bit simple. <laughs> You know, so um, I want us to open our hearts and, um, you know, get ready to receive from God again, you know, because our daddy is going to be ministering to us, you know, shortly. And let's open our hearts. For those of us who are just, you know, joining, like I said earlier, that this is not to overthrow our faith. This is not to say that we are not getting it right. This is mercy that God has shown to people who are already laboring people who are already working so that they will become more accurate. Jesus said, any tree that bears fruit, my father will prune it so that it will bear more fruit. So there are fruits you have grown and then see this as one of God's ways of pruning you so that you can bring forth more fruit to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah.